Hi, everyone, and welcome to Radio Cloud Native from Marantis. Every week, we break down tech news in the cloud native world and beyond. I'm Eric Gregory. And I'm Nick Chase. Good to have you back, Nick. It was a lot of fun <laughs> talking to John last week, but always glad to have you. How are you doing? Thank, I'm doing good. John is always a riot. I, I love him. He is <laughs> so awesome. He is my brother from another mother. <laughs> but I yeah, did miss a... doing this, yes. Uh, so this week we'll be talking about ARM elbowing its way into the cloud. See what I did there. As yeah. well as non-terrestrial 5G. Mm -hmm. Shift left security trends, computer science education, and so much more. Let's hop right in. So first off, Google Cloud announced a new ARM-based compute engine VM option called Tau T2A, marking the first ARM offering from Google Cloud. They were the last of the big three public cloud providers without an ARM product, so ARM has now achieved a trifecta, and presumably world domination will follow. <laughs> Google described the Tau T2A offering as a cost-effective and performant option for, quote, scale-out workloads, including web servers, containerized microservices, data logging processing, media transcoding, and Java applications, end quote. The VMs offer up to 48 vCPUs per machine with four gigabytes of memory per vCPU and 32 gigabytes per second of networking bandwidth. Uh, beyond the specifics of Google's offering here, it's really the industry-wide move toward ARM that's notable, I think. We've yeah. seen AWS using ARM in an increasing number of offerings like Lambda. They've even got EC2 instances using Apple's ARM-based M1 chip hitting general availability this month. Uh, and we can expect Amazon and uh, Google, uh, to, sorry, Microsoft and Google to follow that trend. Ultimately, you know, this is good news for portability, I think, making it easier for software written for an ARM architecture to travel from the from cloud to cloud as needed. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can't, what, what's the point <laughs> if you can't move your application when you need to? Absolutely. Oh, goodness. Well, speaking of moving around, uh, Qualcomm, Ericsson, and Thales are talking about making 5G available everywhere, which sounds like the same old, same old sales pitch. But in this case, it's actually above and beyond, literally. Uh, the 3GPP Global Telecommunication Standards Body version 17 adds support for non-terrestrial nodes. So these well, companies that. are looking to combine satellites and terrestrial resources to provide 5G service literally everywhere, including over oceans and in the middle of forests. So maybe I can finally get service out by my barns. Wah, wah. Uh, oh, that would be so nice. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, version 17 also includes public safety and non-public networks, and version 18 indicates that uh, work on version 18 uh, is looking at uh, artificial intelligence and extended reality. So uh, interesting to see what comes about there. Uh, and of course, edge computing also continued its inexorable march into all of the world. Uh, Fierce Technologies reports that, quote, Lumen Technologies is expanding its edge computing solutions into Europe, starting with the UK, France, Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands with additional locations planned by the end of the year. The company said that Lumen edge computing solutions can meet approximately 70% of enterprise demand in these European countries within five milliseconds of latency. As part of the European deployment, Lumen enabled an additional 100G MPLS and IP network connectivity, as well as increased power and cooling at key edge data center locations, unquote. So what is all of that edge demand? Edge firm Stratus Technologies and analytics consulting firm Espalier, which I hope I pronounced correctly. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry if I did not. Uh, it wouldn't be the first one I've butchered. Uh, have shared market research identifying key use, re key use cases and industries projected to drive edge computing adoption up to 60, uh, up to 46 percent through 2026. The findings project, the findings project. <laughs> Excuse me, my tongue is broken. <laughs> the findings project strong market demand for simple, protected, autonomous edge computing solutions as part of combined software and hardware archi architectures required for business critical processes in monitor and control, supply chain, manufacturing, ex execution systems, MES, and batch management, asset performance management, or APM, and access control use cases, in case you were wondering what all of this is about. However, there is one use case that is causing just a little bit of trouble, and that is, believe it or not, 
smart thermostats. So, Eric, you know how your thermostat, you know, smart thermostat lowers the temperature at night and then about six o'clock in the morning, it starts warming up your house? In theory, if it worked correctly, yes. In theory, if it worked correctly, <laughs> yes. Well, uh, remember, thousands of other thermostats around town are doing the same. So uh, what happens is this is stressing the electrical grid because, you know, you know, all of these things are kicking on at the same time. Uh, so, I mean, it, what do you think about all that? We often build these systems with an assumption of kind of a, a single user, right? Uh, you know, it makes me think of like GPS navigation and then the sort of path towards figuring out, okay, well, what happens if you're directing everyone to take the same of, you know, most efficient route at a like highest volume traffic time of day, uh, you know, that, that that's something these systems have had to adapt to over time. Yeah. Uh, so I think we're, we're going to see that same kind of expansion towards more successful systems level thinking probably yes. in that space as well. That, that's really what we need. We need more systems level thinking, really kind of uh, overall, not just, you know, not just on these smart devices. I mean, it would be easy to say, okay, well, you know, let's, set these devices so that their default on time is, you know, some random number of minutes before or after six o'clock so that everything doesn't come on at exactly the same time. Yeah. Um, but you're right. It requires this overall holistic view of all of the systems that we deal with, um, you know, particularly and uh, I'm going to claim my transition here. No, no, I was yep. pre I was prepared to make that. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Your, your screen even went purple for a second, uh, and like it, it was celebratory. Celebratory. It was like there you go. A disco light sort of spinning. Uh, so uh, over in the security realm, uh, Protocol has an interesting story on SNCC this week. And if, if you don't know SNCC, it's a suite of developer centric security tools focused on the cloud native space. And it operates notably on a freemium model. And that's a lot of what this article is about. So right. it, this I piece, think it's sneak. Sneak? It's sneak. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah that, that's the uh, challenge of this world where we uh, we see our tools spelled out in often creative ways. Uh, yes. <laughs> so and, and, yes. It, it, for those who are, or, who are um, listening to this, it's actually spelled S-N-Y-K. Uh, and so I actually would have gone with SNCC also, except we used to have a CMO who was obsessed with this company and talked about <laughs> it all the time. So I, like, yes. I, I enjoyed thinking that it was like the sound when uh, Wolverine's claws come out. That's exactly the sound that I was thinking when you said that. As soon as you said SNCC, that was exactly what came <laughs> to my head was the comic book sound of, of a knife coming out. <laughs> Um, All right, so uh, so yeah. this piece in Sorry. protocol. Right. No, no, you're good. Thank you. Uh, so so this piece in protocol is basically a feature story on how Sneak has grown and developed their product, rather than like a hard news piece. But I thought there were some nuggets worth talking about. So the premise here is that Sneak is one of the first companies to find a lot of success adopting a quote product led growth or freemium model for security tools, and part of that success has come from focusing on developers. So quote from the piece. When it comes to application security tooling, the final decision is increasingly shifting to the development team rather than the CISO or CIO, Forrester analyst Janet Worthington said, the same progression that evolved in enterprise software over the last decade. In 37% of organizations, the development team now holds the budget for application security tools, up from 27% last year, she said, citing a Forrester survey. So that's interesting, the development team is holding the budget for application security. Here are some hard numbers suggesting some momentum for a shift left approach to security where application security is prioritized earlier in the development life cycle. But these numbers have it more specifically owned by the developers. The article talks about development teams often not liking to kowtow to externally imposed security requirements and to choose their own tools. And you know, I think that's notable. And I'm curious, where do you see this going? Do you think we'll see a larger trend towards developer-centered security tooling? I think we're going to have to see a larger tool, a larger trend towards developer centered security tooling for the simple reason that whether developers like it or not, it it's impossible for it is impossible for the software industry to proceed in any kind of reasonable way without us developers actually 
taking the initiative and making sure that things are that that security is baked in and not bolted on. Mm -hmm. We don't like it. We don't like to think about it, but we're going to have to. Um, and really, it would be good if developers could be proud of how hardened their their software is. Um, you know, here at Marantis, I mean, we made our made our bones, so to speak, as, as the uh, you know the, the mafia expression would be. Um, you know, early on in the OpenStack world, where we would basically take the OpenStack, the the upstream OpenStack distribution, and harden it. You know, make sure that you know the it was, it, it, we shouldn't have had to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, should, it should have been baked in. And I think if OpenStack was starting today, uh, it, it probably would be. Oh my God, that was so long ago. It was 10 years ago. <laughs> oh my God. The ceaseless march of time. The ceaseless march of time. That's all the gray. All, the, all this gray, I had none of this gray 10 years ago when I started this job. <laughs> none of it. So if we see that uh, that shift, if, if we see it shifting out to the developers, what are some of the benefits and the challenges that you think are likely to emerge from that? Well, I, the challenges are obvious. Um, partly, partly you've talked about some of them, you know, in the protocol story, which is developers don't like these external rules. They don't like tools to be imposed upon them externally. They don't like rules that they have to follow because they, they want to do things their way. Um, but benefits, uh, I think that there, there are multiple benefits, which are once developers kind of learn security um, and they can feel more, uh, they, they can kind of feel more confident in, in what they're doing. I know when I was actively developing, um, no matter how, no matter how confident the customer was in what they ultimately got as the developer, I always felt like everything was going to fall apart at any moment. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, I just did because I knew where all the holes were. Um, and so I think as developers, when we learn how to do security properly, uh, there, there will be that kind of added uh, confidence in what we're doing, first of all. And second of all, um, nobody, wants their, nobody wants their software breached. Nobody wants to be responsible for millions of dollars of you know, lost whatever. And with business being more and more and more and more and more automated, um, this, is, this is not optional. <laughs> We, um, you know, and external security tools are not going to do the job. They're just not. Um, you you can have the best perimeter security. Um, all it takes is one employee with a bad attitude, and you're done. You know, so or uh, making a an easy mistake often, <laughs> or making or making an easy mistake. That's true. That's true. It doesn't even have to be intentional. So. Uh, serious benefits. See, see, I can actually talk seriously about things occasionally. <laughs> Not all the time. But, yeah. Well, shifting gears uh, f and following up a little bit on a story from a couple of shows ago. Uh, a few weeks ago, we reported that Rust is coming to the Linux kernel as soon as the 5.20 release, which is set for this fall. As with any change to literally anything in the world, <laughs> there's been some community sturm and drang over this, particularly oh, over... Dear compatibility issues between Rust and the GCC compiler, which could lead to fragmentation in the ways that the kernel gets compiled. That particular concern is one step closer to resolution with this week's news that the GCC steering committee has voted to approve the contribution of GCC Rust to the overall GCC project. In a mailing list announcement, GCC steering committee founding member David Edelson said, quote, we look forward to including a preliminary beta version of GCC Rust in GCC 13 which past release cadences would suggest will appear around May of 2023. So what this will do is unify the whole compilation paradigm. So, so this is a step towards a single comprehensive compiler regime for GCC, assuming that Rust lasts longer in the kernel than the last attempt at a second language, C++, which was abandoned after a two-week trial run in the 90s. Oh, my God. 
Rusty Colonel Detractors argue that the Rust tool set is immature, and I, I don't know, kind of the, the, it's a hipster language. That sort of seems to be the, the vibe you get from. <laughs> I'm sorry, rough guys, but it is. It is um, it, it, you know, be that as it may, uh, <laughs> God Emperor Torvald has cautioned that the inclusion <laughs> of this second language in the kernel is no more or less than an experiment. But having a memory safe language is definitely a useful resource from a security perspective. And a big stage like the Linux kernel would presumably encourage some maturation in the tool set. So, you know, we'll be watching the story with interest. Uh, and as I said before, the 5.20 uh, kernel release is expected this fall. I gave it 10 days. <laughs> you, you think it's going to be four days shorter than, than C++? I think it's going to be four days shorter than C++. <laughs> if C++ couldn't make it, and, and with Torvald saying, it's just an experiment. I gave it 10 days. Oh, I love this. We'll have to put down bets. I'm going to think about what my bet is and, and yeah. come back next time. All right. Yeah. Put down bets. Love I it. Gave it. I gave it 10 days. Okay. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. So as the war in Ukraine grinds on, an estimated 13 million people have left their homes. And while many have gone back determined to return to some sort of normalcy, something like 5 million have lost their jobs. Uh, Upwork, which is a remote work mar uh, marketplace and the Tent Partnership for Refugees, uh, or Tent, a global network of over 250 major business businesses committed to supporting refugees have launched the Opportunity Unlimited Connecting Displaced Professionals to Remote Work Project, a new initiative to connect tens of thousands of professionals displaced from Ukraine to skilled remote work opportunities. Uh, quote, as permanent employment may not yet be available for most refugees from Ukraine, uh, said Gideon Maltz, executive director at the Tent Partnership for Refugees, freelance work is a lifeline for connecting them to income and leveraging their skills, especially in the IT and digital sectors. Hayden Brown, president and CEO of Upwork, added, we've been in awe of the Ukrainian people's resilience over the course of this crisis, having figured out how to take their work with them and continue earning a livelihood over the most impossible circumstances, unquote. And we have, we personally, you and I, Eric, have actually seen this as well. We've got a colleague who is in the middle of all of that, and God bless him, he just keeps doing his job. Mm -hmm. Uh you know, and uh, we we send our best wishes for him and uh, for his safety. Absolutely. Uh, Tent and Upwork are partnering with organizations like P uh, Pioneer and the United Nations Internet uh, International Organization for Migration, and NGOs such as Tech tech fugees and humans in the loop. In addition, Upwork will be providing support services such as access to talent coaches who will help displaced professionals register on Upwork, identify skills that are in high demand, and advise them on how to market themselves to companies seeking independent talent as well as skill certification and badging. Um, companies interested in joining the initiative can find out more by visiting. Uh, and for those who are on the podcast, I will read this out. Uh, HTTPS uh, colon slash slash uh, www.upwork.com slash opportunity dash unlimited. That is upwork.com slash opportunity dash unlimited. Um, for those who are not aware, Ukraine is a hotbed of technical talent. So um, if you are looking for someone uh, to, to help out, uh, now is really the time to, to investigate. We, we highly recommend um, helping these people out. Mm -hmm. um, all right. And speaking of Ukraine, uh, back in what March, we talked about Elon Musk providing Starlink terminals to keep the country online. That was back when we could feel ambivalent about him. Uh, now it is our sad duty to sort of close the loop on the whole Musk Twitter saga, at least for now. Uh, as you know, Elon Musk was going to buy Twitter for $44 billion. And as you may also know, he has now backed out of that deal, claiming that it was because the company has not been forthcoming about data on how many accounts on the platform are actually bots. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're shocked. Just shocked, I say. Uh, well, after months of trying to prevent the sale, uh, Twitter's board is not only suing Musk to make him go through with it, 
They've also successfully petitioned the court to have the trial in October rather than February 2023, as Musk requested to stop the, quote, ongoing harm due to Musk's disparagement, unquote. Uh, please. <laughs> can we can we let, please let it end talk, yeah let it end well please. however however much we feel that uh, i think anyone working at twitter feels that oh my god really by. yes yes we our, our hearts go out to you guys <laughs> as, as well please just make it stop <laughs> <laughs> just the, the whole i it, you know what it is you know what it is really i'm just tired of people doing stupid things just to get attention Oh, which sure. I am yeah. convinced is what this whole thing was all about. It's, it's like a toddler trying to get attention. Obviously, I am never going to get a job at Tesla. That is, <laughs> I have just killed any chance that I had as if I would ever want to work at Tesla. But yeah, obviously, I am never going to work at Tesla <laughs> um, or SpaceX, which I might have actually considered. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's that. Trying to think of a segue here. Yeah, um, there is none. Uh, children, children. We were talking children about children who need to be educated, what, and to be educated. Uh, and we're talking about computer science education. So there's there an open letter out this week urging U.S. governors and education leaders to prioritize computer science education much more highly than they do currently. The letter is spearheaded by education nonprofit Code.org and signed by just about every CEO you can think of. Uh, that's not quite true, but it's like not so far off. Um, Feels like it. As well as some university presidents. And, and here's a representative passage from this letter. We call on you to update the K-12 through curriculum in each state for every student in every school to have the opportunity to learn computer science. This has broad support among parents, students, teachers, and employers. Why? Because computer science provides an essential foundation, not only for careers in technology, but for every career in today's world. Studies now show that students who learn computer science outperform in school, university, and beyond. At a time when every industry is impacted by digital technology, our schools should teach every student how technology works to learn to be creators, not just consumers. Instead, this basic skill is taught only to the lucky few, leaving most students behind, especially young women and students of color. The United States leads the world in technology, yet only 5% of our high school students study computer science. How is this acceptable? We invented the personal computer, the internet, and the smartphone. It is our responsibility to prepare the next generation for the new American dream. And that's the end of the, the quote on that passage. So on its face, this seems pretty straightforward and uncontroversial. I think most people with a tech background and maybe without one who've either worked in education or have a kid will agree that what passes for computer science education right now is really woefully inadequate. Woefully uh, inadequate. It's, it's pretty easy to sign on to that letter. And I think a lot of the signatories have good intentions and code.org does a lot of good work. But, okay, we're on a topic where I, I'm going to i got to go off a little bit. Oh, we get an Eric grant <laughs> instead of a Nick grant. For once, we get an Eric grant. Oh, I'm, oh, it's I true. Wait, let's, hear true. It. let's hear so, it. So, okay, here's my problem with it. And, and, and here's why I find it, like, honestly, a little galling. It's too easy to sign to this. This this comes with no um, no sort of commitment to anything serious. Uh, there's one mention of commitment, and, and here it is. This is the, the, quote, commitment that signatories make. Quote, the undersigned commit our support by collectively creating employment opportunities for computer science students in every city in the USA and in every sector from manufacturing to banking, from agriculture to healthcare. Many of us offer internships to help these students find their career pathway. Many of us have funded efforts in computer science education to support underserved communities, but there's only so much industry can do by ourselves, unquote. There's only so much industry can do. Of feels kind of self-pitying. This is like planning a potluck and saying, if you prepare and bring a delicious meal, I promise to eat that meal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, U.S. governors responded with their own, uh, quote, compact to expand K-12 through computer science education. And they said in this, this compact, this isn't the only thing they said, but this is kind of their commitment. They said, quote, with this compact, the undersigned commit to expand K-12 through computer science education for students in their states and territories, which may include the following strategies. One, increasing the number of high schools offering computer science courses, which may be supported by requiring all high schools in the state or territory to offer at least one computer science course. 
establishing rigorous K through 12 computer science standards, creating a state or territory plan for K through 12 computer science, implementing clear and flexible certification pathways for computer science teachers, and creating programs to provide computer science to pre-service teachers. Second thing they mention is allocating state or territory funding to K through 12 computer science education. And the third thing is creating pathways to post-secondary success in computing and relating careers, rela related careers. And fourth is providing equitable access to computer science for all students, unquote. And kind of like the other letter, hey, on its face, most of these are good goals. And I want to believe that we're going to see positive change out of them. But I fear what we're really looking at here is like a round robin back padding session between government and industry. <laughs> To actually adequately address the gap here, we would need like transformative expansions of funding in education. And the governor's compact talks about allocating funding, but with no specifics whatsoever. Um, you know, much like the the industry letter, they say some of us have provided some funding for some things, but uh, very vague, right? Uh, with that, that item is without specifics, and it comes in a conspicuous second place to issuing requirements to schools and creating standards. And that means what it always means. It means passing the buck to underfunded schools and teachers. <laughs> so nothing. <laughs> yes. Uh, so if big tech wants more well-trained talent, which is you know the the screaming subtext of of the letter, instead of complaining to the manager, they're going to need to get involved in a serious <laughs> way. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Uh, these Wait, companies... You rant. You really rant. I love this. This is awesome. <laughs> but the, <laughs> these companies really need to think about their place in the bigger social picture that shapes the workforce that they want. And uh, going back to that systems level thinking we were talking about before, yeah. and I'd suggest that they're not going to solve the problem with, you know, fly by night boot camp startups that you know they love to fund or letting employees take days off to volunteer at code camps. You know, those are nice things, but but we need systems level. Uh, solutions. This is a deep tissue structural issue, and it requires like, some initiative just beyond just complaining or waiting for someone else to solve the problem for you. And that doesn't have to mean just paying into the society through taxes, though that might help. Uh, they can play a bigger part in helping to craft curricula. Uh, there was a paper in the Harvard Business Review suggesting that more companies should fund debt-free education programs. That's an option. Yeah. The key thing here is they're going to have to take the problem seriously, think creatively, invest real time and effort, and think of themselves more as a stakeholder in a wider system than as recipients of a good, you know, as, as, as recipients of a prepared workforce ready to go. Uh, and at the same time, this isn't just to, you know, um, <laughs> complain about industry leaders. Leaders in government are going to need to think bigger than requirements and standards, and they're going to need to prioritize education much more highly, remembering that it plugs right into everything from the economy to defense, right? Uh, so that's my incredibly cool-headed objective take. Any thoughts on, on <laughs> this topic, wow. Nick? <laughs> um, yes. Yes. Many, many thoughts on this topic. Um, first of all, I, first of all, I'm so I I am I am in awe of your ranting because because when I rant I just rant but you have ranted with a point and that point of the fact that we need systems level thinking to make real transformative change in education and industry and how all of these things work yes yes you're right and this is something that um is not it's not an instantaneous thing um we need people to be organized to make this kind of thing happen so wow wow eric you are that that's amazing so so what really needs to happen is there needs to be some kind of organization that can do the work to figure out what really needs to be done and and to kind of push this organizational change nationwide um wow. i think that's i think that's why i feel a little disappointed because I, you know organizations like code.org are, are i think pretty well placed to do that and i have a certain consciousness here that i'm i'm a little bit doing what the letter was doing right i'm complaining about another organization not not doing the thing i want to see done <laughs> Um, well, so so I want to offer that caveat, but uh, I, I think a you know a, 
a nonprofit with such deep tech ties and and uh, a, a sort of level of credibility, you know, built by doing a lot of great work, has an opportunity to to push that. And I wish I could say this felt like a first step, but it honestly kind of doesn't. Like like it really sort of feels to me like you know talk rather than than well, action and and. You you know the thing is though. Eric and and I, I I hate to say this because I you know I don't want to I, I don't want to sound like I'm kind of overstepping anything but maybe they just don't realize it you know I mean that's that's the thing I mean you and I are sitting here talking about it and look this is something that has kind of come upon me in, in various other conversations that have nothing to do with radio cloud native over the last <laughs> few days, which is individuals can have outsized effects on systems without even realizing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we all, and, and this happens in the tech industry, a lot where we all have a, a bit of imposter syndrome where we're just kind of like, well, you know, I'm not as smart as those other people. Um, but, you know, we don't tend to think about the fact that a person can really make a difference um, in, in something that may not have been thought of. In the early 90s, I initiated one of the first applications that used a browser to update a database. Nobody was doing that, okay? If you wanted to update a database, you had to have a database application and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, why don't we just use the browser? to do that. Now, the fact that I did that because I didn't want to learn how to build a database application is completely irrelevant. <laughs> okay. But the fact is, I thought of that. Okay. I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just saying I was one person and I thought of that, that nobody else had thought of at that point. Maybe nobody else has thought of this, Eric. Now, if they have, I would love to hear from those people. Okay, wouldn't you? Oh yeah, you'd love absolutely. To hear from those people going, yes, we know this, and you know that we're prepared to do blah 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 blah. Um, I would well, love to hear Code.org's response to this proposal of what needs to actually be done. Well, and you know, I think th this is a bit adjacent to what you're saying, but. Um... Part of the problem here, too, is that so many folks in government and also so many like constituents and stakeholders just in the public don't necessarily have the technical background to perceive right. the, the problem, right? Uh, exactly. they, they might even perceive that there is a problem, but not exactly... You know, okay. What does a what, what does a curriculum need to include? What would what would constitute a, 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 an acceptable uh, and, sort yes, of federal standard and, for and, for these kinds of uh, how much funding needs to go into it, right? Uh, and in a um, you know in, in a system like ours, if the public doesn't understand the problem, that, that itself is a problem. Uh, so you know, talk about systems level issues. Yes, that is that is very true. And I'm going to out you a little bit here. Uh, the fact that you are in fact a teacher a well former, uh, teacher. former teacher yeah I, i've so, talked about that before on know, the show so i'm, I'm yeah, uh there you go. so i'm not really I'm a touch biased but <laughs> yeah but but the point well you know biased or not you have kind of inside look of how this needs to work as yeah. well so um i you know i i would love to hear i would love to hear from some of these organizations and 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 their their thoughts on um what we would need to do to kind of you know, whether they feel we would need this kind of systemic change. I, I agree with you. I think we do. Um, and, and how they think that uh, it, it could come about. Yeah. Well, to be so. continued, maybe, maybe we'll uh, have further discussion in the future. That, that would be it. Yes. Very true. Very true. All right. Well, uh, so I am sorry to say that the crypto apocalypse continues this week. 
with a couple of bits of bad news. First, you may remember that back in late June, we told you that if you had an account on the troubled crypto platform Celsius, you should go ahead and file a small, a small claim suit immediately so you could get a judgment before the company went bankrupt and avoid being at the back of the line with the rest of the unsecured creditors. Well, if you've been holding off, I'm afraid it's now too late. Uh, last Wednesday, Celsius filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection less than two weeks after crypto lender Voyager did the same. Voyager's collapse was itself precipitated by the default and bankruptcy of one of its customers, the Three Arrows Crypto Hedge Fund. All of this shows the dangers of investing in an unregulated industry. I mean, if your broker goes under, up to $500,000 of your investment is protected. If your bank fails, the FDIC guarantees $250,000 of deposits. Uh, if your crypto deposit holder fails, you are pretty much out of luck. Um, but more than that, there are no regulations controlling how the company behaves. Uh, Timothy Cradle, Celsius's former director of financial crimes compliance, told CNBC in an interview that he felt that in many ways the company's failure was due to a failure of risk management, but also uh, the company engaged in more serious actions such as currency manipulation. And that's all if it's a legitimate exchange. Uh, the FBI this week is warning that criminals are approaching legitimate investors with fake apps and have stolen get this, $42.7 million from 244 individuals between October 2021 and this May. That's a few million. Uh, that is a lot. That is a lot. Uh, not that the U.S. government is entirely against crypto. It's just that they're taking a cautious approach meant to ensure that there is uh, no harm to consumers or economies or, let's face it, U.S. leadership in the financial space. Uh, this past month, the Treasury Department released a proposed framework for international engagements that's meant to fulfill President Biden's executive order on ensuring responsible development of digital assets. The framework basically defines uh, what the U.S. will do with regards to electronic currencies in relation to different organizations such as the G7 or the International Monetary Fund, and the emphasis seems to be on moving cautiously, but moving, uh, developing financial products based on these technologies, particularly with U.S. companies. So that is uh, that is what's going on there. Oh goodness! So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's craziness. It's craziness. Um, yeah. What the the dumpster fire continues. Um, the dumpster fire continues. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel I do feel bad for anybody who is invested. I, I really, honestly, do. Oh, absolutely. I, uh, there's just such a such a grifting culture, uh, so firmly entrenched. I've seen some of the um, people associated with the, the three arrows hedge fund uh out there like grifting for new projects uh, <laughs> even <laughs> after these collapses like it's uh man it, it really is kind of astonishing to see and i think it speaks to just some some really primal drives right to to be in before everyone else and to and, and then fomo not to get left behind right and to uh have that one clever call that you made that, that you, you blew up big on and, and now you're made for life. Like uh, it's, it's, it's sad. It, it, it's it's kind of sad. Yeah. And it, you know what? And it's, it's, um, it, it's kind of greed, you know, it's, it's greed in, in a lot of ways. And I, yeah, like you, like you say, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's just, I feel bad. I feel bad for the people who've kind of lost everything, you know? So anyway. Yeah. That's 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 that. All well, right. what, what do we have to close? We have wackadoodle. Oh good. We have wackadoodle. Uh okay. So let's see here. Um Let's see what we got. Uh, the, well, this is this is not one for you to guess, but um, a mysterious radio signal has been detected from a distant galaxy, according to MIT. Uh, 
photo, uh, according to the Boston Globe, uh, the signal is a fast radio burst and intensely strong burst of radio waves, the uh, MAT said in a statement. Usually, the mysterious signals last for a few milliseconds at most, but this one lasted up to three seconds and included bursts of radio waves every 0.2 seconds in a clear periodic pattern. How about that? Mm. That is that is kind of wackadoodle. Very cool. Uh, you know, I by the way, by the way, um I, I you know, I, I watch a lot of science fiction movies. Um I run a science fiction movie on Saturday nights if anybody, you know, is interested in that. But um it occurs to me that if aliens ever land on this planet and we integrate them into society all of those movies where aliens are evil <laughs> will suddenly become immensely inappropriate yeah really awkward really awkward <laughs> like politically incorrect uh yeah so so that's it um all right we have we do have a a wackadoodle for you to guess okay Eric, and and as always, anyone who is listening uh, to this live, uh, you know the I think we're up to one hundred and twenty five dollars on uh, on a gift card for Ooh. anyone who can guess before Eric. So, um, let's see here. So uh, this past well two weeks ago, there was in New York an event that happens four times a year uh and it has to do with the sun what is it hmm. new york the sun um i thought of a joke immediately but i don't think i can make it on here um <laughs> let's see uh an annual, do you say it was annual or, or uh, every four years? Uh, no, no, four times a year. It happens. Four times it a happens year. in it if, about four times in, in a year, twice in the spring, twice in the summer. All right. I think they, um, you know, they, they, they wave a rod over to Central Park and just try to get them to pitch a, a ball straight into the sun. Pitch <laughs> ball straight into the sun. I love that. That's what he's known for is, is it, pitching, right? That, well, I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> totally, totally <laughs> no clue. Um, but um, so it, you said straight into the sun. So straight and the sun are a clue. Hmm. 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 I give. What do we got? What we got is it is called Manhattan Henge, a unique urban phenomenon where four times a year the sun <laughs> sets in such a way that it is perfectly framed by the buildings of new york you can see straight to the sun over new jersey so let me let me see if i can share my page share my screen for just a second to show it to you uh <laughs> While you're doing that, uh, where around where I grew up in uh, Appalachia, in the, the southwestern corner of Virginia, we had a tourist attraction called Foam Hinge, which was just Stonehenge, but it was foam. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, that's also a beautiful site anyone could stop by. There you go. There you go. Well, that is, that is um, Manhattan Hinge. Can you see this? Not at the moment. I don't know if you can see this. This is weird because it says it's sharing, but it's ah. There we are. There we go. So um, yes, so that is that is Manhattan Hinge. Uh, the sun comes down perfectly between the buildings. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a few blocks on which you can see it, uh, and it does that uh, four times a year. Beautiful. So, yeah. Apparently, there's a Chicago Hinge as well, um, but I don't know anything about it. There you go. Ah, uh, anyway. All right. So uh, that brings us to the end. Um, 
Let's see here. Uh, all right. So uh, you can find Radio Cloud Native on LinkedIn uh, live every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Or if you're more of a podcast person, uh, we would love if you would subscribe uh, by searching for Radio Cloud Native in Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever podcast application catches your fancy. Uh, and if you have gotten this far in the broadcast, I'm going to assume you found this useful. So please tell your friends. Uh, in the meantime, I want to thank uh, all of you who joined us live. And if you're listening uh, on demand, thank you for your time. We know we know you have many entertainment choices in your life. And we thank you for choosing this one. Um, and I want to thank Eric. Uh, for Eric Gregory, my co-host, for joining us here. And, of course, uh, today's super producer, Sharla. Thank you so much. And thank you, and Nick. Also, I saw something in the chat that I want to throw out there. Oh. looks like someone guessed the wackadoodle, uh, but there's no way for us to see the comment right now, but it looks like they did. Ah, so. if they get – yes. Oh, that's what that – that's what that was all about. I wondered what that banner was. Someone guessed wackadoodle. Fabulous. Okay, we get to give away the gift card. So, um, Sharla, if you could get uh, that person's information, we will take care of it. Fabulous. Okay. Thank so, uh, you well so done and congrats. Much. Congratulations. All right. So, join us live and you can, uh, you know, you can do it. You can get it. See, it is possible. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. All right. We'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.